Um, let's see here. Is there still feedback going on? I can't hear that. Um, all right, let's try this. Can you guys, is that better? Are you all able to hear me? Is there feedback? Okay. I'm not sure exactly how to correct it. Um, uh, let me just make sure that everyone that is not speaking right now is muted. Um, all right. I'm going to go ahead and get started and introduce myself. Let me know if the feedback gets worse um, and we can contact tech support here. We haven't, um, but my name is Ali Toomey and I am the education coordinator for Earth Echo International. Uh, I have been working for Earth Echo for the last three years and I am so excited. We're hearing audio from Jacqueline's computer. She should be muted. Let's mute and unmute. Let's see here. Did that work a little bit better? Okay. I don't know. Magic of technology. Who knows? Um, do something twice and it'll work. Um, well, again, my name is Allie Toomey. I'm the Education Coordinator for Earth Echo International. And we are so excited to be presenting this day of the National Biodiversity Teach-In alongside Elgin High School um, and Ms. Perryman's class. And we are really excited to have with us um, our presenters for this afternoon. We have two wonderful ladies from the NOAA um, National Marine Sanctuaries Office. So I'll go ahead and introduce them. Um, Jacqueline is the Education and Outreach Coordinator for NOAA's Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. Jacqueline develops and implements sanctuary education, outreach, and communication plans that inspire ocean conservation using the concepts of ocean literacy. Prior to her work with the Olympic Coast, she was an outreach program coordinator for the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, probably a little bit warmer down there. Um, and she graduated from the University of Connecticut with a BA in communications and marketing. She has worked in marine conservation and outreach since 1992 and holds a United States Coast Guard 100 gross ton master's vessel captain's license, which is much larger than any boat that I have ever driven. So. Um, and then we also have Jen Denate Mint. Um, currently, she coordinates the education and outreach for NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program from Hollings Marine Laboratory in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, she serves as a liaison between the research, education, and stakeholder communities. And in this role, um, she gets to fuse her passions for science, communication, and people while translating current ocean acidification research in a way that is relevant and understood by a variety of audiences using diverse delivery formats. So both of these ladies are wonderful, wonderful science communicators, and I am going to throw it over to them. Uh, okay, hi, can everyone hear me? Great. Okay, my name is Jacqueline. Thank you so much for having Jen and I here today. We're really excited to be part of this National Biodiversity uh, Teach-In event. This is our first time, so again, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to speak a bit about National Marine Sanctuaries, and um, then Jen's going to jump in and talk about how this ocean of ours is changing, and then we'll talk together about how we can be sentinels of, of this changing ocean. So let's get started by taking a look at our planet. So what do you notice? It's written in pretty big bold letters there that the Earth is blue. 
The planet is covered by one massive ocean. This is 71% of the planet is covered by the ocean. And it affects every human life. It doesn't matter where you live, it's going to affect you. Take a deep breath. It affects you because most of the oxygen in the atmosphere originally came from the activities of photosynthetic organisms in the ocean. Also, fresh water. The ocean supplies most of the fresh water from the rain that originates in the ocean. It also moderates the climate, it influences our weather, and affects human health. We owe so much to the ocean. We get food from it, medicine, it provides jobs, um, it transports peoples and goods. And we can't forget that it's fun, right? I mean, I have a ball being out in the ocean when I'm, whether I'm boating and sailing, or if I'm surfing, body surfing, snorkeling, it's a great deal of fun. And for many people, they use it for recreation. And it's also an inspirational area. How many times have you gone to the Bay Beach and just been so inspired by the ocean? Well, I hope today you're inspired by what you see when we show you things about the ocean. And we can't forget, too, that the um, ocean also plays a very important role in many cultures. Okay, now let's take a look into the ocean and the life that lives there. So the um, ocean is three-dimensional, right? So it goes all the way from the bottom of the seafloor all the way up to the surface. So it does create the most living space on the planet. And the diversity of animals that live in this great ocean is huge, much more than it is on land. And so from the smallest microbe that lives in the ocean all the way to the biggest animal that's ever lived on the planet, the blue whale. Yes, even bigger than dinosaurs were. These animals can get up to the um, length of 34 meters and weigh 120 tons. That's huge. It's over 110 feet. Here's a fun fact for you. A blue whale's heart is the size of a small car. Its aorta, that's the main blood for us, uh, vessel, Alone, it's large enough for a human to crawl through it. So it's huge. These two that are spotted here were spotted in Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And this is just one of the places that these whales are known to come to feed on krill during the spring and summer months. So in order to protect this great big ocean um, around the world, we have marine protected areas. And these are designated in order to conserve these special places. In the United States, we have a system of national marine sanctuaries designated to protect more than 170 square miles of marine and Great Lakes waters. And this goes from Washington State, where I live, all the way to the Florida Keys, where I used to live, and from Lake Huron in the Great Lakes, all the way to American Samoa in the South Pacific. And this network includes a system of 13 national marine sanctuaries, and right now we're growing. Um, and also two marine national monuments, including Papahana Makuakea on the Hawaiian Islands and Rose Atoll. So as sanctuaries, we serve as trustees to these special places. Um, we try to balance use and enjoyment with long-term conservation. Um, and one of our missions is to protect these resources, resources. And we do this through research. So we look, what is the state of the sanctuary? Um, how is it changing? And we do it through education, like today, what I'm doing right now. We try to raise public awareness to these special places and um, the issues that affect them. And then also through management, we try to take a look at what we learn from science and promote that, um, and then promote conservation through management. And each one of these spots that you see on the map there, they're all extremely unique. And they offer an incredible amount of diversity of ecosystems. So I'm going to take a few moments to just explore some of these diverse areas that sanctuaries protect. So right here, we have a picture of some humpback whales. Um, these are migrating through the Hawaiian Island humpback whales National Marine Sanctuary, where they mate, calf, and nurse their young in the warm, shallow waters surrounding the Hawaiian Island. And sanctuaries support coral communities that flourish. Can you believe that these corals that you see in this picture here and sponges, that they occur more than 100 feet below the ocean surface? These are in Cornell Bank National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of Northern California. And sanctuaries also tell the story of our maritime history. The very first National Marine Sanctuary was the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary 
and that's um, dedicated to the USS Monitor, which is a Civil War era shipwreck that lies 230 feet below the surface of the Atlantic Ocean off of North Carolina's Outer Bay. And sanctuaries also include coral reefs like this one in the Florida Keys. It is the third largest barrier reef in the world. One of my favorite places to visit, and it also supports extensive seagrass beds, mangrove islands, and more than 6,000 species of marine life. And sanctuaries also support lush kelp forests and deep sea canyons, like those found in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. This treasured area protects our nation's largest kelp forest and also one of North America's largest underwater canyons. And then throughout there, we have an amazing variety of marine life. And it also supports areas with migration routes. So with one of the longest mag um, annual migration routes of any, marine, of any mammal, roughly 10,000 miles per year, we have the gray whale. And these gray whales here are found throughout three national, I'm sorry, five national marine sanctuaries from Channel Island, which is in the, in the south part of California, all the way up to the northern area of the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary off of Washington and beyond. And of course, we can't talk about the ocean without talking about the ocean's greatest predators, the sharks. The Living Bottom Reef of Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary off of Georgia provides an important habitat for hundreds of fish species, including the scalloped hammerhead, which you see up top there. And then the nutrient-rich waters of the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary provides critical food um, sources for migrating white sharks, which are there off of California. And all of these special places are just off of our nation's coast. And they're full of life. They're full of wonder. And uh, this picture you're looking at here, this is where I work. But actually, as you can see, I work in an office. Um, but this is the place that I work to protect. And this photo was taken off of um, from Cape Flattery, Cape, Cape Flattery, which is the northwesternmost point of the contiguous United States and located on the Macaw Tribal Reservation. And it overlooks Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. So, uh, a pretty amazing place. You can see it's quite undeveloped. Um, it, it borders protected areas like Olympic National Park, uh, Washington Maritime National Wildlife Refuge Complex, and Washington State Parks, as well as four coastal treaty tribes um, that have their lands adjacent to the sanctuary. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Olympic Coast, um, because it's where I am right now. And we're located off the, the coast of Washington. You can see the map here. Um, the red line shows its border. And the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary covers uh, much of the continental shelf. And you can see how it heads out over three major submarine canyons um, in places that reach depths of over 1,400 meters or 4,500 feet. And it includes incredible deep sea coral communities and some of the most diverse kelp beds in the world. And the rocky shores of our uh, Olympic coast have some of the highest biodiversity of marine invertebrates and macroalgae of all the eastern Pacific coastal sites, all the way from Central America to Alaska. And within our waters, we have 29 species of marine mammals that either live or come in our waters to feed. And this area also attracts some of the largest seabird colonies in the U.S. And I mentioned how this area is super high biological productivity. The reason for that in this region is because it's fueled by seasonal upwelling. This is along the edge of the continental shelf. So you saw that earlier in the map, how it's the continental shelf, and especially at those submarine canyons during the spring and summer when sunlight is increased. And the way this upwelling works, and you look at the diagram there, um, the summer winds come from the northwest and push the coastal waters offshore. And this allows the deep, cold, nutrient-rich water to come to the surface where photosynthesis takes place. And it produces huge blooms of phytoplankton. And as we know, that's the beginning of the marine food web. And this helps feed zooplankton and many other organisms. So if we went off to the coast and we took a plankton sample with a plankton net, and this would be a net that's very um, very fine mesh with a little cup at the bottom, and we took a, a big um, 
a big net in there, put it in there, and grab a little cup of water, you'd probably see something like this when you pulled it out if you looked underneath a microscope. Um, this would be the sea so soup, all full of plankton, um, abundant. And all of this abundant plankton attracts and feeds many species of marine life, including forage fish and invertebrates. And these, in turn, feed predators like shark and salmon and seabirds and marine mammals. Um, and also highly migratory species, such as albatross and humpback whales, which travel thousands and thousands of miles to feed off the waters of Olympic Cove. Um, so I'm going to take a moment and show you a few images of just a few of the animals that rely on this abundance um, of nutrients off of Olympic Cove. So we have humpback whales and leatherback turtles. This is the largest turtle in the world. Black-footed albatross. These are birds that will, seabirds that nest in Hawaii, but will come all the way to Olympic Coast in order just to feed. And huge migratory fish like this big tuna. And dolphin, like this white um, Pacific white-sided dolphin. These animals are really sociable, and they can usually be found in groups of up to 50. But sometimes they gather in these megapods where you have a thousand or more gathering together in the offshore waters. And then our rocky intertidal area, this is where there's a great abundance of invertebrates. We have animals like the ochre sea star, which are the predators of the intertidal area. And these animals, they can actually digest their prey outside of their body. You're going to have to look that one up. And then salmon. This is coho salmon pictured here. And they are one of seven species of Pacific salmon that live in the sanctuary. And they're extremely important to the region's economy and to our culture. And sperm whales. These guys are incredible. They can dive great depths up to 1,000 meters, over 3,000 feet. And they're in search of their favorite food, the giant squid. And then we have deep sea corals, like this bubblegum coral pictured here. And this, like other corals, are comprised of hundreds of thousands of, um, hundreds or thousands of, of these little animals called polyps. So this is a big old colony of, of little animals called polyps. And then animals like skates. This is a big skate and can, can get up to eight feet long. And China rockfish and other rockfish, there are some rockfish that can live to be over 100 years old. And then these are barnacles that look a little different than most barnacles you're probably used to seeing. But these are gooseneck barnacles. And these are a tasty delicacy to our indigenous tribal people of the region. And they are often saved for the tribal elders because they're so good and special that they um, go to only the tribal elders. And then this is a mola mola, which is really fun to say, mola mola. Um, and they can grow up to a ton or 2,000 pounds. They're also called sunfish. And they get that name, the ocean sunfish, because sometimes they like to lay flat on the ocean of the, uh, the surface of the ocean in order to um, be warmed up by the sun. And wolf eels. This guy's hiding in a little crevice there. But it's not an eel at all. It's a fish. But it gets its name because of its eel-like body. And sea lions. Um, also, we have seals, but um, you can tell the difference between a seal and sea lions is that sea lions have that external ear flap that you can see there, where most seals don't have that. And Friday jellyfish. This is one of the many jellyfish that live in our area, and this is probably a very yummy treat for the leatherback turtle that we saw earlier. And octopus. And this is a small octopus that we have in our deeper part of our ocean. Um, we also are home to the largest ocean in the, uh, the largest octopus in the world, which is the giant Pacific octopus. And a uh, fun fact about octopus is that they have three hearts, nine brains, and their blood is blue. Kind of cool. And we have sea otters. They're extremely important to our marine environment, especially to our kelp forests. Um, they're considered keystone species. Um, they were actually hunted to local extinction, which is called extirpation, in Washington in the early 1900s during the fur trade. Um, but in 1969 and 1970, they were reintroduced, and they've gradually made a comeback. And now we have what we started out with the reintroduction of about 100. Now we have about 1,600. And these animals have the densest, densest fur of all 
mammals, um, which is why that they were in such high demand during the fur industry. And they have about a million uh, fibers of fur per square inch. And hermit crabs, great recyclers of shell. As they grow bigger, they need bigger shells, so they keep on moving up. And seabirds, like the tufted puffins. These guys are beautiful to look at, but they're also amazing um, swimmers. They actually will fly under the water, like many seabirds do, in order to catch their prey. And then this cool-looking animal, which is a Venus flytrap anemone. And it gets its name because it resembles the Venus flytrap plant, but not only does it look like it, but it's the same, it eats in the same way by sticking food to its um, body. And so all this life and more, so much more. I, I, I eliminated, eliminated half of my photos because um, they're just so fun to look at, but we don't have time. But all of this is found off of Washington Pacific Coast in a well-balanced ecosystem. And these marine animals depend on a healthy ocean to sustain their life, to provide it with shelter and food and a safe place to reproduce. And remember, humans also need this ocean. So what would happen if we disrupt this balance? Is it possible that human activities can actually change this great ocean, you know, this huge ocean, and potentially put an end to the biodiversity that makes it so abundant? This is a challenge that we are facing. Uh, we know that our planet is facing challenges from climate change. Well, there's another CO2 challenge, and this will impact our ocean, and it's called ocean acidification. So I'm going to turn it over to Jen now to talk about this challenge and the science behind it. Thanks, Jacqueline, for showing us all of those amazing features. Those well-balanced ecosystems. Can you all hear me okay? Awesome. Great. <laughs> Perfect. So as you can see, I too work in an office, um, but I am working for our oceans as well, and I focus on a specific challenge that Jacqueline mentioned, and that's ocean acidification. So here in this picture, you can see both of the carbon dioxide challenges facing our blue Earth. Carbon dioxide, which is released into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels to power our cars and provide electricity to our homes, is causing changes in our climate and influencing weather patterns as well. But actually about a third of that carbon dioxide emitted in the atmosphere actually ends up in our ocean, which is causing this change, ocean acidification. Ocean acidification can be measured or seen as a decrease in the pH of the Earth's ocean waters. So how do scientists measure ocean acidification using pH? And some of you may be familiar with the pH scale, but it tells us how acidic or basic, another word for basic is alkaline, substances are. And alkaline or basic substances are higher on this scale, so they have a higher number here. The scale runs from 0 to 14. And you'll see them in the blue and purple colors on this scale. <clears throat> and you can actually see that seawater, our ocean water, is slightly basic or alkaline. It has a pH of 8.1, which is changing due to ocean acidification. We'll get back to that shortly. But substances that are neither basic or acidic are neutral. They have a pH just hovering around 7. And acidic substances have a pH that is below 7 on the scale. So you can see some of them here in those warm colors, reds, oranges. Think sour, maybe lemon, vinegar. Those are acidic substances. <clears throat> because of what pH is actually measuring, so this scale actually is measuring the amount of hydrogen ions, or H pluses. So you can see, although the lower the number, the more acidic, it actually means that there's more hydrogen ions which cause that acidic or sour taste and are causing those changes in our ocean as well. So I actually like to think of the pH scale as a pH plus scale, measuring the abundance of hydrogen ions in a substance. <clears throat> so this change in pH of our ocean is happening relatively quickly. 
So although we mentioned the ocean is slightly basic at a pH of about 8.1, Scientists are already seeing a drop in the pH of our ocean waters. And this graph actually shows pH of the world's oceans over the last 20 million years of Earth's history. And as you can see, pH has fluctuated between a little over 8 and 8.3 over the last 20 million years or so. And then you see at about 1800, a sharp decrease, a sharp drop from about 8.15 to we're about 8.1 today happened. And that 1800 mark is industrialization. So think factories, we started making things, producing things. And you can see this is actually a prediction of what might happen at the end of this century. And that's an expected drop of about 0.3 units over the next 100 years of pH. And this is a much faster change than the ocean and the life within it has seen in a very, very long time. And although you may think, oh, just 0.3 drop units, a drop of 0.3 units is not much, the pH scale is log logarithmic, just like the Richter scale in earthquake. Or in earthquake. So therefore, a pH change of of 0.3 units is actually about a 150% increase in acidity. So where does this carbon dioxide that's causing this change in pH come from? We can think of seawater having many ingredients, three of which we're actually going to see and talk about here. And these ingredients in the right proportions make a recipe for the ocean which allows it to be healthy, balanced, and the creatures within it to remain in balance as well. So here you can see on this top graph you see carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is going up. And right along with that I just put an arrow over the line of carbon dioxide in our ocean waters and it too is increasing as well. So the amount of carbon dioxide going into our ocean is increasing. And if you take a look, this is a much shorter time scale. We're talking about the last 30 years here. So this is actually measurements that scientists have taken in the water. So with this increase in carbon dioxide is where we see this decrease in pH. And we've seen a, a drop of about 0.1 units, or 30% increase in acidity, just in the last 20 years. And we also see something else. There's another key ingredient in the ocean's recipe, and that's called the carbonate ion. And that, too, is decreasing. And, you know, many of you may not be familiar with the carbonate ion, and that is quite all right. <laughs> But they're actually very, very important because the carbon and ion is what is directly connected and used by a variety of the organisms, many of which Jacqueline showed us that live in our sanctuaries. Because those carbon and ions actually make up the building blocks of shells and skeletons of many marine animals. So once again, where does this carbon dioxide come from, from ocean acidification? So I want you all, you know, we, we emit carbon dioxide every few moments. So if you guys wouldn't mind, I would love you to all take a very deep breath in through your nose and then let it out through your mouth. So you just emitted carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, as do other mammals, like the whales we see here, the moose on land, with every exhale they take. So do you think our breath is the culprit behind this, this CO2 challenge, this ocean acidification that scientists have been measuring? No. The air that all 7 billion people on our blue earth breathe out is a very small fraction of what of the changes we saw in the last few graphs. Although the majority of carbon dioxide emissions don't come from our breath, they do come from some of our everyday activities, such as transporting ourselves in cars, Maybe we go places on planes. <clears throat> that alone is about 31%, a third of the carbon dioxide emissions emitted to, into the atmosphere. Another third of it actually comes from electricity, 
from powering our lights, our computers, in our homes. So what happens? What's the chemistry behind when this carbon dioxide is absorbed by our oceans? And how does the ocean's recipe change? Carbon dioxide is absorbed by our oceans. And how does the ocean's recipe change? So when carbon dioxide mixes with water, it forms carbonic acid. So once again, that's where that term ocean acidification comes from, because there's actually a small acid form. But this doesn't stay along in the, in the seawater for too long. It actually breaks apart or dissociates into our friends, the hydrogen ions. So you can see here why that increase in hydrogen ions or decrease in pH is linked. We also get an increase in bicarbonate. But with that increase in bicarbonate, we actually are getting less of those carbonate ions. And for those of you that might remember, carbonate ions are those building blocks for many shelled and organisms in our marine system, as well as skeletal parts for some marine creatures as well. So for those of you that may not be into chemical equations, that's quite all right. <laughs> The one, the one thing, or a few things that you can remember is that hydrogen ions are increasing as carbon dioxide enters our ocean. And with that increase in hydrogen ions, we see, and we have measured that decrease in pH. <clears throat> we see more bicarbonate ions, which may or may not be a good thing, but they actually outcompete carbonate ions. And those carbonate ions are very important. So we can see carbonate ions, as they're less and less abundant, it may make it more challenging for, build, for creatures within the ocean to build their skeletons and shells. So pictured here, the carbon ion actually forms with a calcium ion to make calcium carbonate shell, shell, shells and skeletons. And you can see that in so many different creatures. So some of, some of you may be familiar, but corals have calcium carbonate skeletons. So the corals in the corners here. Krill, small shrimp, have calcium carbonate shells. Shellfish, like crabs, clams, oysters, all of their shells are made out of this calcium carbonate structure. You see sea stars, sea urchins, and even these tiny phytoplankton that we were talking about that produce and have provided us oxygen, have calcium carbonate parts as well. <clears throat> and so like if you dropped an antacid tablet <clears throat> into an acidic environment, it would dissolve. Animals with calcium carbonate structures like these are finding it harder and harder to keep their shells and skeletons intact because of the change in the ocean's recipe. <clears throat> So you may recognize some of these organisms from those that Jacqueline shared that we can find in our oceans, in our national marine sanctuaries. So krill are up in the upper right here. Whales love to feed on krill. Do you recognize any of the others? You may recognize this crab. But I have a question. Now do you all recognize any of these images here? <clears throat> these may be harder to recognize. These are actually the young or larval form, they're quite wacky looking, of these creatures. So here we see an adult copepod and then a, a young copepod. Here we see the krill, and it's young. Doesn't it almost look like that octopus that Jacqueline showed us earlier? <clears throat> so copepods are often eaten by small or young fish. As we mentioned, krill are eaten by whales. And what all of these have in common is their plankton. So it's like what that cup of ocean that Jacqueline showed us. These might be some of the things that we see in that, that net pulled up from our sanctuaries. And seeing that these animals, or zooplankton, these really tiny animals, are really small, so they're not only susceptible to being eaten, but they're also susceptible to our changing ocean and that recipe that's changing. So the amount of carbon dioxide in their environment is changing, which can have a cascade of effects on the ecosystem and whether or not it can stay in balance. So we know that the ocean provides life for many living organisms that create the food web that we are a part of as well. And if these animals, 
many of which are at the bottom of the food chain, end up becoming weaker, then we will become weaker as well. A beautiful organism that's at the base of our food web is a sea butterfly or pteropod. Pteropods are actually called potato chips of the sea because they're such an important source and they're so abundant, but such an important source of food for many of the animals in our ocean. So scientists are trying to understand how these beautiful creatures will be affected by increasing carbon dioxide and ocean acidification. So here you can see these pteropods, these sea butterflies, are actually marine snails. So they have a very thin shell, but they actually fly beautifully through the ocean, which is where they get their name for these little wing-like protections, the foot of their, their shell or their body. So here you're looking at a pteropod that is in ocean water that has today's chemistry, so the carbon dioxide that's in the ocean today. Now take a look at what happens to a pteropod that's been exposed and lived about a week in waters that have a little bit higher carbon dioxide levels, so near future in the next 20 or 30 years, scientists predict. And finally, take a look at this pteropod shell that is in the far future, the end of this century. And you can see the shell actually has small holes in it. So scientists on the west coast here, here we're taking a closer look, sort of honing in on their shell with a microscope. And the scary thing for scientists who work on the west coast, these shells were collected from pteropods that are in our ocean right now off of the west coast. And they found sea butterflies living in the wild with partially dissolved shells, which suggests that the chemistry, our ocean's recipe, <clears throat> that is here today can be acidified enough to cause shells to dissolve. So say they are seeing the effects of ocean acidification in the wild for the first time off of the west coast of the United States. So I've spent a lot of time talking about plankton, you know, the base of our food web, pteropods and the potato chips of our sea and how they may be affected or challenged by higher carbon dioxide conditions. <clears throat> but this salmon pictured here, actually a big part of its diet relies upon these potato chips, these pteropods. But this isn't the only challenge these salmon will, will face. They may be losing their, their potato chips, but they also have CO2 challenges or carbon dioxide challenges of their own. And they're not alone. So clownfish, some of you may know them better as Nemo, damselfish, and rockfish, just like the one Jacqueline showed earlier, are when they're in waters that have more carbon dioxide, they have challenge that's it's harder for them to grow as fast or as big. And they actually behave differently. So those that are exposed to high, CO, high carbon dioxide waters or acidified waters actually have a harder time detecting predators, detecting danger. So detecting those sharks that may be feeding upon them. Another challenge that the carbon dioxide presents to some of these fish is the ability to find their way home. So just like we saw in the movie Nemo, Nemo had his home anemone, and so it's harder for clownfish in our ocean to find their way back to the anemone. For salmon, which are abundant and Jacqueline mentioned are really important to the, off the coast and to the communities along the west coast of the states, these salmon are having trouble, you know, and finding their way home is a bit different for them. Salmon are actually born in freshwater rivers. And then they head out to sea. So they head out to sea these, as these tiny fish and grow up to adults, hopefully not being eaten by any predators or sharks. And then they come back to the river they were born in to reproduce, bear offspring, and on is the next generation of salmon. So in higher CO2 waters, scientists have actually found that salmon, it's harder for them to find their way back to their home river. 
So today we've talked about amazing organisms that we can find in our ocean. <clears throat> I've shared a little bit more about some organisms at the base of our food web and how they are challenged by carbon dioxide along with these bigger organisms like fish whose diets are largely composed of pteropods or those potato chips and other plankton at the base of the food web. And we've seen that fish also have challenges of their own when it comes to facing higher carbon dioxide or acidified waters, <clears throat> like detecting prey or predators. So what does this all mean? So scientists are, you know, have taken a look at some of these direct effects. How will sea butterflies be affected? How will species like salmon be affected? And they're starting to get a better grasp on that. So here in these green circles, you can see shellfish, corals, plankton, phytoplankton, and krill. Scientists have done work on all of these organisms and found that they are negatively impacted or challenged by higher carbon dioxide in their waters. The question that remains for scientists and what scientists are almost like modern day explorers, they get to the next questions for them are wondering what are the indirect effects? So although We've seen effects on fish, krill, phytoplankton, corals, and shellfish from ocean acidification. What does that mean for the whales or the sharks that we haven't studied yet? Because their food and those other organisms that they're connected to in the food web are changing. <clears throat> so as I said, scientists are much like modern day pioneers of the ocean. And ocean acidification is actually a relatively new field of study. It only got its name about 12 years ago, which is very, very recent. And so scientists are exploring the challenges that carbon dioxide and this change in the ocean's recipe will pose to marine organisms throughout the food web and how it may affect the balance of the ecosystem. So one thing scientists are exploring is how the response of certain species like krill or those copepods at the base of the food web will imp have impacts up the food web or chain. For example, these two zooplankton species, copepods and krill, respond differently to higher CO2 conditions. So how will that affect our fish and our whales? And although scientists have discovered that fish like the clownfish, damselfish, rockfish, and salmon change their behavior, in higher CO2 waters, <clears throat> they actually aren't able to detect the, th the threats of predators as easily. But we haven't yet figured out what that means. How will that impact the rest of the food web, these predator-prey reactions and how they may change? For example, how will rails respond to changes in krill abundance? And salmon, who are not only part of the marine food web, but have interactions on land. So salmon, when they go back to the rivers, are eaten by birds, bears. So if salmon aren't able to detect, detect their predators, how will this affect all of the other creatures in the food web? <clears throat> Another big question out there for scientific explorers is we've actually found that some fish aren't as sensitive to higher CO2 waters, which is great news, right? But these fish that may not be directly affected or directly sensitive to acidification rely on plankton, such as copepods, for their food, for their diet, for their nutrition. So they are, in fact, connected. In fact, everything is connected. <clears throat> so we're learning that ocean acidification can cause cause large changes in an ecosystem by affecting the abundance of just one or a few species. To say this another way, not all species in a food web need to be sensitive to this carbon dioxide or challenged by carbon dioxide or acidification to cause a major shift in the food web. So right now, scientists are working every day to figure out what species are sensitive to ocean acidification and what that may mean for our ecosystems and our food web. And what it's sometimes easy to forget is that people are actually part of the food web. You and me are part of the food web. So many people that do live on the coast or do not directly depend on fish. So about 85% of fish that is caught is eaten. 
and 4.3 billion people on this earth. That's more than half. Fish is, they rely on fish for protein in their diet. So even if we don't live in an ocean, as Jacqueline mentioned, we rely on the ocean because the phytoplankton within it have provided oxygen in our atmosphere and made the atmosphere the way it is for us to breathe today. So we are all connected, and what happens to our ocean affects us, and what we do on land affects our ocean. And although the organisms in our marine ecosystems are facing the challenge of carbon dioxide, they're facing some other challenges as well. Climate change is increasing temperatures. We're seeing changes in the amount of rain, the timing of which, which can affect stream flow, river flow, where those salmon are. And actually, just in the addition of fresh water of that rain, it actually changes our ocean's recipe. When that fresh water runs out into the ocean, it actually makes it more acidic as well. So another ingredient that we're adding to the ocean is nutrients from agriculture or even on our lawns that ends up in the ocean, changing that recipe as well. But the good news is, is they're actually whole communities, whole cities working towards keeping this the recipe of our ocean in balance and happy. So there are communities and neighborhoods, whole communities getting together to buy solar panels together to put on all the roofs of their homes. That only not makes it more affordable for them, but their whole neighborhood no longer has to rely on the burning of fossil fuels to power their homes and gain electricity. Cities, there's cities around the world that are moving towards alternative energy like wind. They're increasing their mass transportation, giving people like the people on this yellow bus right here a reward. If you're using mass transportation, you get on the fast track to wherever you're going, just much like the HOV lane, if any of you all have experienced that. And we actually see neighbors getting together, friends getting together to help their friends and neighbors make their homes more energy efficient. So whether that's changing appliances that are more energy efficient, or better insulation around windows and doors, or maybe it's adding solar panels. And so these are examples of people, communities, cities taking action. But Jacqueline and I actually have a carbon dioxide challenge for you. Okay, so here is the carbon dioxide challenge for you, for your friends and your family. You can all take it. We want you to reduce your carbon footprint. So one way you can do that is drive less. Encourage your family, your friends to ride a bike when it's safe or to use public transportation. You can support bike to work week for your family or bike to school days if it's something that works for your community. Um, you can cut electricity bill and also help um, save the environment um, by just cutting back electricity. Like if you're in a room and you're about to leave, turn off the lights when you leave. Um, if, you, if it's really cold, put on a sweater instead of turning that heat up. These are simple things you can do. And something that a lot of people aren't aware of are um, these things that we call energy vampires. Electronics and chargers that are not in use will suck electricity. In fact, the average charger is consuming about a quarter of a watt of energy when it's not in use. And even worse, a charger that's plugged in and fully charged devices in it, it uses 2.2. 24 watts every single time. So instead of, you know, like your cell phone or your tablet, instead of plugging in and leaving it overnight where it would be um, way overcharged and maybe even hurt your battery, plug it in an hour before you go to bed and then pull it out um, just before you go to bed and you'll still have a fully charged um, tablet or phone when you wake up in the morning. It doesn't seem like a lot when I say these little bit of watts that add up, but they do add up, and if you put them and add them up with all the other devices you use, um, they actually can use more than 10% or more of the energy in your house. Um, also, you can look for renewable energy. You guys are in this generation of clean energy revolution. Um, whether you are somebody who's helping to invent it or if you're using it, this is going to be a great future and a great time to be able to use these new energy sources. Also. There's ways that you can, by the way you eat, can make a difference. Um, have you ever heard of Meatless Mondays? Eating less meat and dairy can make a huge difference. 
because um, meat and dairy can cause nearly half of all carbon pollution from food. Um, according to some studies, it contributes to between 14 and 22 percent of the total greenhouse gases that the world produce each year. So a switch to just one vegetarian or vegan meal a week, it's like driving 1,160 fewer miles a year. That's pretty easy to do. Also, shop local. Go ahead and find the fresh foods from your local community. Not only are you supporting local farmers, but you're purchasing fresh food that's probably really good for you, and it didn't travel thousands of miles, uh, which emits a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere and absorbed by the ocean. So buying these fresh will also decrease it and make the place a better environment. Oh, and I forgot to mention oops, that you can buy less stuff. A lot of times that stuff ends up in a drawer or a closet or in the trash bin. If you just use less stuff and enjoy life outside, enjoying sanctuaries, enjoying parks, enjoying being outdoors with friends and family, you're going to end up having a much smaller footprint and um, doing the world a better place. And we want to make sure we support these marine protection areas like National Marine Sanctuaries as these are sentinels for a changing ocean. Um, they are able to, do, to conduct research in order to help improve and maintain water quality, to uh, maintain biodiversity, and to preserve um, and the enhanced um, habitat. Um, but most importantly, we have to remember that it's everyone's responsibility to take care of the ocean and all the living things that depend on it, because that includes us. So if there's time, um, we can Some questions, questions that were coming in were about. Um, Jacqueline, can you mute your microphone? Um, there we go. A lot of questions that were coming in, sorry, were about um, what we can do to help. So I think that your last slide really covered a lot of what we can do to take action. And I think it's important to note that even those of us, like you guys were saying, that don't necessarily live right next to the ocean, we're still all interconnected um, and we can still make a difference. And one thing that I wanted to mention, um, we here at Earth Echo um, partnered with Jacqueline and NOAA Marine Sanctuaries and some other really great um, organizations uh, earlier in 2015. And we will be releasing some new videos and some educational materials that are all focused around what you can do to help um, with ocean acidification. So there are modules to learn about ocean acidification and then how you can take action in your own communities. Um, we did have one other question that I think is really interesting is that are there, so we talk about marine sanctuaries, but are there any freshwater sanctuaries? Oh, okay, so you're saying Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Interesting. Awesome. And then to add to that, mm -hmm. um, we also, so NOAA also has a national estuarine reserves as well. So those are our freshwater or mixed water coastal estuaries, so rivers and bays, and I think there are about 25 of those around our U the United States as well. Near where I grew up on the Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> so um, thank you both so much for joining us today. It was really awesome to have you. And um, we are just about out of time. But thank you again. And everybody, enjoy your Friday and your long weekend if you have one. Um, and thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, guys.